to go rearrange and mess things up again. Hope you all can forgive me for that, but let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I'm grateful to be together with your body today, Lord, and I, I pray that as we gather together around your word, that, that you would reveal yourself to us, God. Uh, we don't want to just go through the motions and come and fill a seat and go home unchanged, Lord, but instead we hope to meet with you. So God, as we gather together, I pray that your spirit would be heavy here, that you would come and that you would, that you would, you would speak to us, God, that you would speak to us in such a clear way that we couldn't deny it. So Lord, I thank you for this time together, and, uh, and I pray for, pray for your blessing on this time. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Oh, it's good to be here. Have you ever, and I'm sure you all have, have you ever been faced with big decisions? I mean, we have decisions every day that might seem big, like what are we going to have for lunch? That seems like a big decision. But no, I'm talking like monumental decisions, like things that come up and you're just like, I know that, that the way I respond to this, to this question is going to change the rest of my life. Have you had those? Most of you have. And if you haven't, you will. Uh, and you just will. You're going to have these two options set before you, and you're going to be looking at them saying, do I take option A or do I take option B? And you just know that whichever way you go is going to change the rest of your life. Now, some of you are getting anxious right now because you're like, man, I don't want to make big decisions like that. That makes me nervous, and I, get, I, I know. But life has those decisions. Those come all over the place, and sometimes they're easy. Sometimes you just go and you do what you know you have to do. Um, one of those came up in our lives, my, my wife and I, about three, four years ago. Um, we knew we'd been called to ministry, and we believed that we were called to, to prepare for that. So we started looking into where we were going to go to get an education and what, what we were going to do. And there was a school in Fort Worth, Texas, 600 miles away from where we were from, away from our family. And we just knew. Like, it, there was no question. We just knew this is where we need to go. This is where we need to be. And it was never hard. Honestly, I never struggled with it at all. Maybe, maybe Steph would disagree. Um, <laughs> I never wrestled with this for a minute. Like, whenever we decided this is where we need to go, I never questioned it for a moment. Like, we knew this is, and some, we knew it was a big decision. We knew it was going to change our lives. We knew that. Um, but it just didn't seem all that difficult. But then there's other times where you have these decisions that come up where it's not quite so easy. It's just not. Sometimes you have these things set in front of you and you wrestle and you wrestle and you just can't seem to get to where it's, you just feel good about it. it. Seems like either way you go, either you disappoint somebody or you hurt somebody or there's just something that seems off and you're not sure what to do and you wrestle and wrestle and wrestle. Have you had those? We have just recently, actually. Um, well, whether we needed to be here with you all, which by the way, we're here. Um, whether we wanted to be here with you all or we needed to stay pat where we were at, and we wrestled with this for months. We talked about these things and prayed about these things, and we just wrestled and wrestled, and we had a hard time making these decisions. And there's even times where, as a church, we'll have difficulties. We'll have hard questions come up, like, how do we address this? It's like either we go this way or we go that way. And sometimes those are hard those are hard. So how do we know that as a church or in our personal lives, how do we know we're making good decisions? How do we know? I mean, that's, it's an important question. If we want to make good decisions, we better know how to make good decisions. I mean, everybody wants to make good decisions. But how? Whew, ugh, it got me. But how do you make those good decisions? How do you make those well, I think we see that in, in the book of Acts. I told you I like to open to a book and just work our way through it. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 again today. Um, and if I'm being completely honest with you, as I was looking at this, whenever I first read it, I was tempted to say, okay, we covered the first 11 verses of Acts. Let's jump to chapter 2. I was really tempted to do that. But then I told my wife, even just, just last night, I said, I would feel guilty forever if we skip this. 
Because if we really believe that all of God's word is inspired, if we really believe that it's all profitable, that it's all good for rebuking, for teaching, for correcting, for training in righteousness, if we really believe that, then how could we skip a part? So I don't want to skip it. I want, I want to cover it. I want to talk about it. And I, want to, I don't want to just talk about it. I want to see how it applies to us today. Okay? And I think it's really clear. These men and women are faced with a massive decision. We're going to see here in the book of Acts that they're, they're faced with the task of replacing Judas because Judas has, like he says, gone where he belongs. So they're faced with this task of replacing Judas. And how do they decide? Well, I was really tempted to say that here at the first church business meeting, they just decided they were going to gamble and roll the dice because that's what we see them do in the end of this. Um, but just so you know, that's not good church policy. Okay, um, Difficult decision. Don't get the dice out and just start rolling them. Um, so I would like to see how they make good decisions. And as we look through this text, I want to show you five prerequisites to making good decisions. Um, but before we do, let's stand together and we'll read God's word. Acts chapter 1, if you're following along, we'll begin in verse 12, where it reads, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who, who were together was about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of David, foretold about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus." For he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. Ouch. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field is called Hakodama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling become desolate. Let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place of in, his, in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast the lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Thank God for his word, and you may be seated. There's a lot here. And some of it's kind of brutal, some of it's kind of almost vulgar as you see Judas die. So what do we do with this? How does this apply to us? Again, you see the decision that's facing these men. You can see this decision. How do we make good decisions in light of what we see here? How do we make good decisions in our lives? So five prerequisites. Number one, first prerequisite is obedience to God's word. Obedience to God's word. Verse 12 starts out, says, then... Then, so where are we at? Let's just, let's just back up a little bit, set the stage. Remember, we just saw, last week, we looked at Acts chapter 1, the first 11 verses, as we saw the crucified Jesus, then we saw him resurrected, and then we see him teaching his people and tell, him, tell them to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit who's going to come. Right? That's what they're told. And then we see Jesus begin to levitate, he floats to heaven, and then a cloud takes him out of their sight. Now that is a gross oversimplification of what happens. If you don't remember, go back, read the first 11 verses, it'll set the stage. But at this point, the very next thing that we see them do after they've just been told to go to Jerusalem and wait, what do they do? They go to Jerusalem. Huh. That's pretty wild. Then they return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem. They did exactly what they were told to do. How about that? 
You want to make good decisions? I would start with, what do we know that we've been commanded to do? What do we know we should do? That's a good place to start. What do we know? So we see they begin with obedience. But see, it's not just obedience to Jesus' command here. Okay, I want to make that clear. They're, they are certainly obedient to Jesus' command to go back and wait in Jerusalem. They are. So they go. But they are also obedient to the Scriptures. It's very clear here in this passage that I was, that, that I was tempted in preparation, and certainly most of us, when we read it, are tempted just to kind of gloss over. This says, a Sabbath day's journey away. That's not put there by accident. That's deliberate. That's intentional. These men were being obedient to the law, even in following Jesus' orders. A Sabbath day's journey, right? Because these are Jewish men, or at least men who had been following a Jewish rabbi. They knew that the law said that on the Sabbath day you were not to travel. So what is traveling? Now, the Old Testament law isn't real clear, but most of the rabbis got to the point at this place where the custom was you could travel, travel 2,000 cubits outside of the city that you reside in. 2,000 cubits. Anybody have any idea what 2,000 cubits is? Anybody want to venture a guess? Half a mile. Man, you are good. Did you cheat? Did you, did you read the notes? Oh, man. And study Bibles. Ugh. Half a mile. About a half a mile outside. Now, what they would teach is that you could travel about a half a mile out and a half a mile back in. That was, that was the custom. You could travel that far, but any more than that was considered work, so it was forbidden on the Sabbath. So these men here, it's very clear to say that they were on the Mount of Olives and they traveled back to the city of Jerusalem, which was about a half a mile. Even in being obedient to Jesus, they were still very cautious. They were clear that they still obeyed God's command in the Scriptures. And that's important. That is important. Because a lot of times what we get this idea... uh, I say we, just so you're clear. Whenever I say we, I'm not meaning necessarily us in this room. I'm talking about Christianity worldwide. A lot of times, we, as Christians, we get this idea that that because we have the Spirit residing in us, we'll get this word from God, and we need to follow that word. And that's true. Okay, Don't hear me say, don't, please, follow the Spirit's guiding. Absolutely do. But what happens when that guiding, that, that, that spiritual feeling you get that says that you should do this conflicts with the word of God? (laughs) which are you going to side with? That feeling that you get or the written word? They had a command from Jesus. God's word, when he speaks to you, it will never, ever conflict with his written word. It won't. He does not contradict himself. He will not cause you to do something that you are commanded not to do in scriptures. That's why John... Whenever he writes the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Does anybody know it by heart? Anybody? No, that's okay. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. How do you test the spirits? Well, again, gross oversimplification. Pick up your Bible and read it. Know it. Meditate on it. Know the scriptures because God will not contradict himself. These men were not only obedient to the word of God that they received from Jesus, but they were also obedient to the word of God found in the scriptures. We need to do likewise. We need to do likewise. If you want to make good decisions, be obedient to the word of God. Just a quick side note. I love this 2,000 cubits. There was a reason I brought that up. That's not the first time this is found in the scriptures. It's not the first time. Um, Actually, if you go back, and this is, again, this is probably getting too far off topic, but I still want to bring it up. You go back to the book of Joshua. As they're getting ready to enter into the promised land, the Ark of the Covenant goes before them, and whenever they set foot in the Jordan, Jordan parts, right? And then they cross over into the promised land on dry ground. Okay, so how far back are the people commanded to stay from the Ark of the Covenant? Well, spoiler, it's 2,000 cubits. 2,000 cubits. Now, I, I love this, this, this picture here. This, this picture, okay? Because Jesus is saying, okay, it's about a Sabbath day journey from here. You can go... Um, I love this. Okay, this is so good. A lot of times in the scriptures, the Jordan River represents death. Represents death. Even whenever we see Jesus baptized, right? It's representative of him dying and being raised again. 
Okay, we see this in the scriptures, and the Jordan often represents death. And the Ark of the Covenant at this time represented God's presence with his people. So they send the Ark of the Covenant out into, the, into what represents death. Death parts, so God shows that he has made a way through death for the people to enter into his promise. And now here, as Jesus has died and he's been raised again, he's reminding them, hey, you can go that far because I've made a way through death. I just love the picture here. They go a Sabbath day's journey. They are, and I told you that was a side note. That's, we'll, we'll move forward. But I love the picture as they go. And then, verse 13, we see them doing exactly what they're told. They come to Jerusalem, they arrive, and they go to the room upstairs where they're staying. And then it lists off these names of the people that are with them. Again, what are they doing in this room? They get back, they're waiting. They're waiting. If you're anything like me, a lot of times you see something and you just want to go. Like, you don't want to wait. Waiting is the last thing on your mind. You just want to do it. As a matter of fact, I probably get myself in a lot of trouble because I can do things kind of rash. I can, I can see something that needs to be done and I just do it and I don't think it through and I just go. Did any of you ever do that or am I the only one? Okay, there we go. But these men knew that they were commanded to wait, to be patient, to wait for God because the task that was coming, they could not do on their own. So they're commanded to go and wait. So they see them go back to Jerusalem. They go up to the room where they're staying and they wait. First thing you need to do if you want to be good at making decisions, be obedient to God's word. Be obedient to God's word. Now, some of you are thinking, Jared, this is the simplest sermon I have ever heard. That might be fair. But are you obedient? I mean, we, a lot of times we overcomplicate things. Like, how do I know where God's leading? Well, you open the Bible, you read it, and you apply it. It's, it's, we talked about science in Sunday school. It's not rocket science. You open the Bible, you see what you're commanded to do, and you do it. If you want to be, make good decisions, if you want to be good at following Christ, if you want to go where God has commanded you to go and do the right things, first step is to be obedient to God's word. Obedience, number one, okay? Second prerequisite is unity around God's word. Unity around God's word. I love that Matt talked about why, why are we here, right? Why do we get together? Why do we do this? Unity around God's word. Verse 14, they're here in the upper room. It says that they, were all, they all were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They were all continually united. Does that describe this church? Now, I'm not trying to be critical of anybody at all, but I just want you to ask yourself, does that describe my church? The church that I'm a part of, that you're continually united? I don't know the answer. Honestly, I think I know some of you. I'm getting to know some of you a little bit, but I don't know all of you well enough to say, yeah, this church is continually united. I, I don't know you well enough. But I want to ask you, because you know, you've, you're here, you're a part of this church. Does that describe this church? Now, you don't have to answer. That's okay. You don't have to answer out loud. It's a rhetorical question. Because these men and women, they got together and they had one thing on their mind. They had one thing on their mind, and that was a devotion to Jesus. They were devoted to being obedient to him. They were devoted to prayer or with him. They, they just, they were devoted to Jesus. And the word here, continually, where it says that they were continually devoted, this word is actually a compound word in the Greek that means it's pros, which is towards or in the direction of, and katareo, which means strength or endurance or power. So we see that they are moving in the direction of strength, which is in this prayer. So we see them moving that direction together. They are growing in that strength. They are growing in endurance. They are continually moving in that direction. They were moving together in the direction of strength and endurance. And then the word unity is also important. It means with one mind or unanimously. So we see these people moving in one direction, and that happens to be the direction of one-mindedness or that direction of being unanimous, being together, being united. Now look, there is no such thing <clears throat> as a perfect church. Let me make that clear. 
Because some of you were thinking, well, that certainly doesn't describe us. I hope that's not what you were thinking. But if you were, understand, there is no such thing as a perfect church because the church is comprised of flawed people. I am a grossly flawed person. I will admit that. The church is comprised of flawed people. So there will be flaws because we bring ourselves to the equation probably more often than we should. And we step in, and at times there's problems. But what direction are you moving Are you moving in the direction of unity? Are we moving in the direction of oneness? Are we moving in the direction of being constantly focused on the one most important thing, which is Jesus? Are we moving that direction? Are we growing in that? Are we enduring in that, striving to be more like Christ? Because that's what what marked these people, right? And I said this was about decision-making. Just think about this in the context of your own lives. Okay, we... We often talk whenever we have big decisions, like, have you sought godly counsel? We have big decisions come up, and I don't know how many people say, seek godly counsel. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Of course that's important. Where is that supposed to be found? It's in the context of the church. And if you're not united with your church, if you're not a part of your church family, if you don't have those close bonds, then people don't feel like they have the right to speak into your life, and you certainly don't feel like you have the right to speak into theirs. You need to be united with your church. You need to have your Christian brothers and sisters together with you so that they can speak into your lives, they can speak into yours, and as a church, you can move forward in one direction. You need this. If you want to make good decisions, you better have those people around you. That's why fellowship is so important. It's why it is so important. You know, what's the commonality we all have in the church? It's it's Christ. Literally, whenever the Bible talks about the church, um, it, it talks about... The word is ecclesia. Okay, and this word that we now have as the church, it, it's literally the fellowship or the gathering. That's what it is. And, and not only is it a fellowship or a gathering, it's fellowship and gathering around a central idea, which is, it's Christ. And if it's not Christ, find a new church. We need to have the central focus of everything be squarely on Christ. We need to have this fellowship, this this ecclesia, this church built around Jesus. And we see these people being obedient to God, going back, waiting on his spirit to come, and they are united continually. That's what marks them. And some people are like, well, how do you you build that? That's that's a million-dollar question in churches. How do you build that kind of unity? How do you do that? Well, first of all, Like I told you last week, the power of the Christian life is only found in the Holy Spirit. So it requires that God's presence be with you. Okay, We can have all the programs in the world, and they're all going to fall short if God isn't in it. Okay, First thing is you got to have the Holy Spirit. Second is be together. Again, gross oversimplification, but be together. How does that work? How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen by accident. Um, a guy who I, I, I listen to some, his name is Robbie Gallaty. Um, one thing that I heard him say that at his church every week, he asked people to take the next step. So, for example, if you're a person who comes to a worship service every once in a while, if you come and you gather together with the body every once in a while, next step for you maybe is to make it a regular thing. If you're a person who comes to worship service every week and you are there religiously, how about that word? If you're there, the next step for you maybe is to become a part of a small group or a Sunday school class. And if you're a part of that, maybe the next step for you is to be engaged in active discipleship. Like one-on-one discipleship maybe. Even, I mean, Bryce and I, we had a discussion about one-on-one discipleship just Monday night, which was, which was wonderful. Maybe that's the next step for you. But the point is, you need to be together. It, it just, it blows my mind when people say, I don't understand why I don't feel connected to my church the way that, the way that people talk about it. I don't get it. Like, when do you see your church? When do you see your church family? And they're like, well, I see them for an hour on Sunday. You want to know why you don't feel connected? It's because you're not connected. It's that simple. Like, if you want to have the unity that they have, they were together, they, and they were, didn't just have these shallow conversations. These people were in prayer together. They were waiting on the Spirit of God to come together. This was intimate time that they spent together. If you want this kind of unity, it doesn't happen by accident. You have to be together intentionally, and you have got to grow together. 
okay? You want to be good at life. First of all, <laughs> you want to be good at life. I actually steal that from, a, from another preacher who said, if you want to be good at life, then just do what the Bible says. Um, okay, if you want to make good decisions, step one, be obedient to God's word. Then have unity around God's word. Third prerequisite is prayer with God's word. Prayer with God's word. See, these people weren't just gathered together to talk about sports, which is what I like to do. I get together with my brothers, and they're some of my best friends. Okay, my brothers are some of my best friends in the world. I love my brothers. But we get together, we talk about sports. It's what we have in common. We talk about sports a lot. But these people were gathered together, and it wasn't about anything else. They were gathered together in prayer, the text says. They were gathered together in prayer. So let me ask you, real quick, do you pray? I see some heads going, yeah, yeah, okay, good. Generally, you pray by yourself, right? We have our quiet time. Some of you may have a room in your house where you go and you close the door. Um, I know some people who pray in the car. Now, please don't close your head, or close your head. Close your eyes, bow your head, close your head. Don't do that either. Um, but you have some people who pray in the car. Yeah, people who have that special room in their house. As a matter of fact, my mother, she has prayers written out that she hangs on her wall that she prays through regularly. Um, I'm very thankful for my mother, but I know she prays by herself. And that's good. That's awesome. And I encourage all of you, have an active and engaged prayer life. Do it by yourself. But that's not good enough. And I want to be careful because I don't want to be legalistic. That's the last thing I want to do here is to sound legalistic. Like there's some checklist, like I pray by myself. Now I've got to pray corporately. Now I've got to... No. No, no, no. We see prayer in the Bible and almost always... Not always, but almost always. It's in the context of the body. They're praying together. Some of us would say that's weird, right? One of the things I was really encouraged about whenever we first started coming up here, though, and I hope it's in here because I didn't look this morning. Ha, there it is. Look at that. You open your bulletin up under church news. It says, Monday there's an elders meeting, prayer meeting, Wednesday, 5.05 in the prayer room, Sunday mornings at 8.30. I was encouraged by that. I was actually excited about that. Because what that is, is God's people saying prayer is important, and they're getting together, and they're praying together. The first church, the first Christians, were united together continually in prayer because they knew it was important. I heard somebody say that prayer isn't the least you can do, it's the most you can do. And whenever God's people gather together with this unity of mind, and they get together and they pray Things happen. Why? Why is that? Because when we gather together and we corporately lay our hearts before God, He's not some distant God who's just going to do what He wants. He's a distant God. Well, one, He does do what He wants, but two, He cares about us enough to incorporate us into that. When we pray, things change, and we need to get together and pray. I was convicted of this not all that long ago. I started thinking about my own life, and, and you know, I, it's really, this preaches really well, you know, it's like you need to pray together as a body, but am I actually implementing that into my life? And I was kind of convicted that I wasn't. Like, I went to a prayer meeting Wednesday night, but then I started thinking, there are Christian friends who I have, and we'll get together, and, and we'll start talking about things, and they will tell me some of their biggest fears in life, like some dark fears. Some of them tell me about their, their loved ones, their, their kids even, who they're worried about that they, their adult kids do not know Christ and they have walked away from them. And I started thinking about this, like, have I ever just stopped where we are and say, hey, let's pray. Let's be united together in prayer. I started thinking, man, I don't do that. I don't do it, but why not? Why wouldn't we? If we really believe that there's power in prayer, like God, he, the Okay, this will blow your mind. The God of the universe, the one who created everything, spoke all things into being. We have a direct line to that God, and we can bring our requests together before him, and we don't. What does that say about us? Like, we should be people who are devoted to prayer, and not just every once in a while or at set times. We need to be doing it all the time, continually devoted to prayer. We need to be praying together. But are we? We see that these people were. They have this big decision coming up, and we see in verse 24, the first thing they do is they pray. And we'll see here in just a moment that the way they pray is important also. 
So prerequisites to making good decisions. One is obedience to God's word. Two is unity around God's word. Prayer with God's word. Number four, desire for God's word. A desire for God's word. Verse 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120. And he said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold about Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. So he gets up, Peter, one who Jesus says he's going to build a church on, okay, Peter gets up, and what happens? He starts to preach. And what's he start preaching about? It's a fun topic, it's the betrayal. He starts talking about how Judas had to betray Jesus this way to fulfill Scripture. First of all, we need to take this mindset far more often than we do. A lot of times we see things in our lives that that hurt us, that are negative, like at least we perceive them as negative, and we're like, oh no, what do we do? When really the God of the universe says, hey, I'm in control of all things. Like even these things that we look at and we're like, man, that's a bad deal. God is using for his purposes. And Peter shows it here through the Scriptures says it was necessary. I think we need to take that mindset far more often and say, God, no matter what's going on in my life, I trust that you're using this for your purposes. Like this is for the good of those who love you. And then he goes on, and he uses the Psalms to say that they need to replace Judas amongst them, right? That's what he says. He says we need a 12th. That's what we need to do. And I, I, I kind of wrestled with this a little bit. And I know scholars have wrestled with this also. As a matter of fact, I've heard a lot of people suggest maybe that that Peter was rash here. That what he really should have done was was wait. Because then you go on and you never see Matthias again. Like you never hear from Matthias again. But instead you hear Paul all over the place. And what a lot of people will suggest is Paul was God's choice for the 12th and this was just their choice. Now, I'm not going that far, just to make that clear. But there are people who will. Okay, there are people who will. Paul himself says that he's an apostle born out of the right time. This wasn't his time. But whether or not they made a mistake, whether or not they were rash, and just so we're clear, it's not out of character for Peter to make rash decisions. I mean, you see that all over the place. Jesus is on the shore. They're all out in the boat, and Peter's like, I got to get to shore, and he dives into the water when the boat's still probably going to beat them back to shore, but Peter's being rash. He just dives in. They come to arrest Jesus, and what's Peter do? He whips out a knife, and he cuts off a guy's ear. He's rash. So this wouldn't be out of character for him. That said, the body, the believers, they believed that they were making the right choice, that they were doing what God's word commanded them to do. They had a desire not just to hear God's word, which they clearly did as Peter gets up and starts preaching, but they also had a desire to see God's word fulfilled. They had a desire for that. They had a desire to do what God's word would have them to do. I hope that describes you. I hope you don't just do this as some academic exercise, right? A lecture is when somebody gets up to speak and it's so that you know something different. And then I heard it said that a motivational speaker gets up so that you do something different. And then I, I, I love this. A sermon is when you get up and you try to introduce them to someone different. Because <laughs> it's all about Jesus. It's, it's all about him. But these people heard it, and they wanted to commune with the God of the universe. They wanted to see his will being done. They wanted him to be there. So what did they do? They heard a sermon, and now this is a crazy idea. This is wild, okay? They heard him preach, and they acted on it. (laughs) Isn't Isn't that wild, right? You hear what God's word says, and then you act on it. That's just a crazy, oh boy, that's wild. I hope you catch a hint of sarcasm there just a hint. They don't stop. They hear God's word and they don't stop there. They act according to the teaching of God's word. They move because of God's word and they act to see God's word fulfilled. They actively want to see it. Do we have that kind of desire to see God's word fulfilled? I mean, we see where Jesus commands to go and make disciples. So are we, do we have a desire to see that fulfilled? Are we going and making disciples? Are we baptizing? I love seeing that video. Did y'all love that? Surely I love that. 
That's awesome. I get excited, like I kind of get giddy, and then I hear about Angel, he's going to be baptized. It's like people are wanting to see God's word fulfilled. Do you have a desire for that? These people did, and they, they moved. Whenever you read God's word personally, whenever you hear God's word, do you want it to affect you? Do you have a desire for that to change your life? I hope and I pray you do, because these people did. You see how it affected them. They heard God's word. They read God's word. They moved according to it. And if you want to make good life decisions, I've heard it say that if you want to be good at life, read the Psalms. Not the Psalms, I'm sorry, the Proverbs. If you want to be good at life, read the Proverbs and do what it says. It's, again, it's about that easy. If you want to make good decisions, have a desire for God's word, but not just so that you can hear it and know it, but so that you can live it. These people did. Prerequisites to making good decisions, obedience to God's word, unity around God's word, prayer with God's word, a desire for God's word. And then fifth, an imitation of God's word. An imitation of God's word. Verse 24, as we work our way down here, we see in verse 24, actually, let's back up to 23. It says, so they proposed to Joseph called Bersabbas, who is also known as Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed. You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. First thing they do is they pray. Did you, first of all, they're praying. So they're imitating Jesus in that, okay? Whenever I say God's word here in this last point, I mean they are, they are imitating Jesus. I want to be abundantly clear. They are imitating Jesus in what they're doing. They saw Jesus live. They saw the way he acted. They saw the things that he did, and they are acting to do likewise, they want to be like Jesus. So they pray. They have this big decision. They pray. And the first thing they do in this prayer is recognize God's sovereignty, his superiority. They recognize it right here in their prayer. Did you catch it? They said, you, Lord, know everyone's hearts. And then they even recognize, they even recognize his will. Oh, man. Nothing will throw a guy off worse than his kid falling over. <laughs> so they recognize God's sovereignty. They recognize it in their words, right? And you can almost hear the Lord's prayer here. You can almost hear it. This is the second week in a row I've referenced this. But you can almost hear the Lord's prayer here, right? Then they prayed, you, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these you have chosen. You can almost hear it. Like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Recognize God's sovereignty right there. What is this hallowed word? It's not something we use, right? It's perfection, it's holiness, it's sanctified. They're basically saying, you, God, are holy, you, God, are perfect, you, God, are sanctified. And here they're saying, God, you know everyone's hearts. They're praying this, like, God, you know. You've got it, you already know. And then they ask for his will to be done. They say, God, show us which of these two you have chosen. Which one have you chosen? Essentially what they're doing is saying, God, don't let us make this decision. We want to follow where you're going. We want to know what it is that you want. And that is exactly what we see Jesus do. That is exactly what they saw Jesus do. And they are mimicking him. They are acting like him. They want to imitate Jesus. I mean, you even see Jesus doing this in some, some of his last moments. Whenever he's in the garden, Luke chapter 22 same author, Luke 22, verse 42. <coughs> he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your, or not my will, but yours be done. Even here, in his last moments, he's saying, God, whatever you want is best. The apostles knew what Jesus had done, and they worked to mimic it. And the question is, do we do the same? See, a lot of times, I, I, don't, I don't think I do. I get kind of selfish whenever I pray, and I kind of give off my wish list, like God's my personal genie. Like, if I just ask enough, he's going to do what I want, and my will can be done because I know God. But that's not the way we should pray, is it? It's not, not what we see here. These people distinctly wanted to see whatever God had chosen, let that be what's done. 
Look, I'm not telling you it's wrong to pray for people's physical well-being. I don't think that's wrong at all. But maybe we should change the way we do things just a little bit. Maybe we should say, God, you can heal this person if that's what you want. And God, we trust you in whatever happens. Let your will be done here. It is hard. It is hard. I'm certainly not saying it's wrong to pray for people's physical well-being. I think that that would be foolish. I think we should pray for people's physical well-being. I think we should pray for healing, and we should not just pray for it. We should also expect it, that people be healed. That said, we need to submit ourselves to his authority, and we need to imitate Jesus in doing so. We need to imitate him in doing so. You want to make good, you want to be, make good decisions, imitate Jesus, and pray for God's will to be done in everything, in everything. There's one more verse here, and I'm just going to kind of tack it on here at the end. And the reason is because I think it's really telling and of something that we run into a lot more than we realize. Verse 26 says, Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. So what do we make of this? This verse says they just rolled the dice to choose the twelfth. So that's what they're doing. Rolling the dice to determine who it is. Here's my opinion. Let me make it abundantly clear. This is Jared's opinion of what this is telling us. Okay? What this is telling us, I think, is a lot of times when we're faced with these two conflicting decisions, it's either go option A or option B, and we have prayed things over. We have, we have consulted that godly counsel. We have done all of these things that we know that we should do to make these decisions, and we still don't have clarity. Maybe the answer is either one. That's what I would like to suggest to you, is it's either one. I believe that there's times where we're given these multiple options, and you go option A, you are right where God wants you. You go option B, you are right where God wants you. Uh, sometimes we like to think things are black and white. It's either one or the other, when sometimes there's some gray areas, aren't there? No? Okay, so there's some, there's some dissension, there's some disagreement here. Okay, that's fair. Again, this is my opinion. Let me make that abundantly clear. I think that's what this is telling us, though, that there are times where it's flip a coin, let God decide, and if you go, he's going to use you where you are. Trust him. Trust that he has led you to this point, and then make a decision. Go. Now, please, don't hear me say that's an excuse to ignore the other things and do what you want. That's not what this is. This is, you have done all of the other things, and God has laid before you two, two good choices. Because you see, both these men are qualified. They selected the two based off of the qualifications they had. And they got to this impasse where we have to choose one. How do we do it? You know, I heard a lot of people whenever we were talking about our difficult decision on where we needed to be. I don't know how many people told me to flip a coin. Now, they weren't saying flip a coin and whatever the coin says, just trust the coin. That's not what they were getting at. They were actually suggesting that that might show where our hearts were. Um, as a matter of fact, one man told me to flip a coin, but don't look at it because that'll mess you up. Okay. Okay, whatever. Then what's the point of flipping a coin? Um, but the point is, I think we get to these impasses where sometimes you go and trust that God will care for it. So what do we do with this? Hey, how do we apply this? Well, I think a lot of that's really applicable and it's on its own. Well, let me just give some scenarios. Some of you think that life is going great. You're where you need to be. You don't have any big changes in your life. These big decisions aren't looming on you right now. What do we do? Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you that you don't have these huge life decisions weighing over you. That's awesome. But these decisions are coming. They face everyone. They will come. And let me just tell you that obedience to God's word doesn't start overnight. Not like that. You have to start. For example, let me just take unity with other believers. Unity with other believers, okay? If you want to have close personal relationships where people can speak into your life and you can speak into their lives, does that happen overnight? Of course not. Of course not. You have to invest yourself in people. You have to invest yourself in people. We talked about this at the board meeting Monday night. It came up that it was like, what's your most precious resource? I think, Matt, you said it was time, right? Your time. Because you don't get any more. You get what you get, and that's it. That's all you get. You can't earn more. Money, you can go earn more. Time, you don't get anymore. That's it. 
When it's gone, it's gone. So you invest time in people. You start to invest that time and you build that equity. You build that relational equity so the people can speak into your life and you can speak into theirs. And that takes time. So the question is, will you begin to build those relationships today or will you wait till that decision's there and now you're like, I don't have these relationships. I don't know who to turn to. I don't have that godly counsel in my life. The answer is you should have started building those relationships years ago. And for some of you, you're sitting here thinking, Jared, I'm in the middle of this thing right now. And well, I haven't built those relationships, so what do I do? Is it just too late for me, so I I got no answer? Well, yes and no. Maybe it'll be difficult right now. But the question is, are you going to just say, well, I have this, this question looming over me right now. I have this looming over me right now, and it's too late, so I just don't start building those relationships at all. Of course not, because more of those questions are coming. They will come up. So will you be prepared for them? Will you start to build those relationships now, or will you wait? Will you start to be obedient? Will you start praying now? Or will you wait? I encourage you to decide to do that today, to be obedient today. Start now. And then there's a third scenario. Some of you are hearing about about this for the first time. Maybe none of you are. Maybe all of you were raised in the church. Maybe all of you are believers. Maybe all of you belong to Christ, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I told you the first thing that has to happen whenever anything comes up, you want God's leading. How does that happen? How does that happen? See, these men these men and women that we see right here in the very beginning of the church. They changed the world because they believe in a God who took on flesh, who suffered and died for the sins of man, who died for them and then defeated death and was raised again. And now because of his sacrifice on your behalf, you can know, you can know the God of the universe. You want to know how to make good decisions that starts with him. Knowing him, personally knowing him, Because he will reside in you. His spirit will come and be in you. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will change you. And a lot of people are like, well, how does that happen? And some of you are like, Jared, this is like stuff I learned in kindergarten whenever I was sitting in a Sunday school class, and that is great, but some people didn't. How do I have that spirit in me? How does that happen? When does that spirit come? Look, the question whether or not you, whether you want to have that spirit. If you want to have that spirit, your responsibility is simple. It is simply to respond to his invitation. How will you respond to his invitation? Will you respond with faith? Because that's all that the Bible says is required. Faith. You're saved by grace through faith. That's not of yourself so that no man can boast. You are simply saved by faith. Do you have that faith? If you do, it will express itself in repentance. You see that all over the scriptures. If you want to make good decisions, it starts with one, trusting in him and repenting. That's it. How will you respond today? Will you start to build those relationships? Will you cultivate relationships with others? And will you have that relationship that will change your life with Christ? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I I thank you for this word, Lord, even though it's been challenging for me, God, I I thank you for it. Lord, and I pray that those those people here today, that they would start to be obedient to your word. And Lord, maybe they've been obedient for years and years. God, I pray that you would use those people as they're obedient to speak into the lives of others around them. God, and I pray that you would continue to deepen us in an understanding of who you are so that we could live differently, so that we could be your witnesses to the world. God, and for those who don't know you, God, for those who haven't experienced your power in their lives, God, I pray, I pray that you would that you would lift that veil. God, that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would that you would speak to their lives, and that you would change them fundamentally to the core so that they could know you, Lord. And I pray that you would take their hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh so that they would know you and live for you. And Lord, if you call them to even die for you. Lord, I pray that for all of us, that you would change us through your word. Lord, help us to be obedient because that only happens through your leading. So Lord, fill us. Help us to trust in you. 
and help us to serve you, Lord, because there's nothing greater than serving you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.